Well, hello, I'm Eric Green, director of the National Human Genome Research Institute, one of the institutes and centers that make up the U.S. National Institutes of Health. Welcome to our webinar to discuss the key findings from the recently released Human Genetics and Genomics Workforce Survey Report, which lays out a foundation for building the essential genomics workforce of the future. Now, in 2020, NHGRI published a new strategic vision for the coming decade of human genomics. That vision included a core principle outlining the need for an immediate and substantial commitment of attention and resources to bring both short and long-term changes that will make genomics a more equitable, just, and inclusive discipline. And one of the first steps of fulfilling that commitment was to create an action agenda for training, employing, and retaining a genomics workforce that reflects the diversity of the U.S. population an effort that was led by NHGRI's Acting Deputy Director, Vince Bonham. Now, while NHGRI is absolutely committed to providing leadership and resources in this area, ultimate success will depend on the collective efforts of the genomics community and its members. That's why we've invited our colleagues here today to talk more about the results of this Genomics Workforce Demographic Survey, actions underway to address workforce challenges, and what lies ahead in the action agenda to build an inclusive, representative, and ultimately more effective genomics community. So now I wanna turn the spotlight over to our moderator for today's webinar, Vince Bonham, who will provide more context and also introduce our panelists. Thanks great, again great. for coming and I'll turn it over to Vince. All right, great. so great, thank you, Eric. Uh, and uh, thank you for everyone who has joined us today uh, to be part of this conversation. Um, I wanna share a few slides to provide some context. So let me bring up my slides and make sure that everyone can see them. So let me just start by uh, thanking you again uh, for attending this webinar today and, and being part of this conversation with us today. And as we move forward, uh, as we really focus on how do we develop uh, the next generation of the genetics and genomics workforce. Um, I am so pleased uh, to participate as your moderator today, but really this is an opportunity to set some context of the report uh, that we all had an opportunity to review uh, and where we are today with regards to um, our profession and the future of our profession. So the purpose of, of our, our webinar today is to, is to discuss the key findings of the Human Genetics and Genomics Workforce Survey Report and to begin a dialogue regarding the future of the human genetics and genomics workforce. So again, we are only at the beginning of how we can collaborate and partner uh, to address the challenges that we have. I want to just acknowledge and recognize all that was involved uh, with regards to the development of the report. Uh, I particularly want to highlight uh, the institutions that are identified here, the American Society of Human Genetics, the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics, the National Society of Genetic Counselors, the Association of Professors of Human and Medical Genetics, the American Board of Medical Genetics and Genomics, and the Minority Genetic Professional Network each participated in providing an opportunity for their members uh, or their constituents to participate in the report. And I just wanna thank you. And I particularly want to acknowledge and thank the American Society of Human Genetics for providing the leadership for these professional societies uh, with regards to the survey uh, and the development of the report. So I'm gonna give you a couple of takeaways from my perspective and, uh, and hopefully we will hear from each of the panelists of their own views about some of the major takeaways from the report. But one for me is that the report lays an important groundwork for the future assessment and action by individuals, organizations, departments, governmental, nonprofit, academic industry sectors in the field of genetics and genomics. So it provides us all data that can help us as we move forward. Second, that the majority of the survey respondents identified were U.S. citizens. As we look and understand the diversity of our genetic and genomic workforce, understanding who makes up the workforce is so important. Um, that women made up the majority of the survey respondents, and we may get into that conversation as we think about the professions uh, and um, the, the majority of the individuals within genetic counseling being women, and how we look at this report from the perspective of the different professions. Um, the genetics and genomics workforce is predominantly homogeneous, with 67% of the respondents identifying their race, ethnicity, or ancestry as white. 
uh, and respondents occupation areas of genetic counseling. 45% of the respondents uh, made up that their uh, primary profession is genetic counseling, 30% uh, with research, and 23% in academic were the top three primary areas. So these are just some of the takeaways of the uh, importance of the data that we all had an opportunity to review. Uh, but I want to put this in context of where we are as a field, and I often go back to October 2020 and the strategic vision that the National Human Genome Research Institute published for the field. Uh, and I, I'm going to take a couple um, quotes from that uh, vision statement that I think are appropriate for our conversation today. In essence, with the growing insights and structure and function of human genome and ever improving laboratory and computational technologies, genomics has become increasingly woven into the fabric of biomedical research, medical practice, and society. The scope, scale, and pace of genomic advances to date were nearly unimaginable when the Human Genome Project began in 1990. Even today, such advances are yielding scientific and clinical opportunities beyond our initial expectations, with many more anticipated in the decade. So a recognition that um, our field is moving very quickly and the need for the next generation of the workforce is so important as we prepare for all the exciting things that are happening within our field. The second quote is this. Both in research and clinical settings, the global genomics workforce, as with the general biomedical research workforce, falls considerably short of reflecting the diversity of the world's population, which limits the opportunity of those systematically excluded to bring their unique ideals to scientific and clinical research. So this is a challenge that we face as a field uh, and hopefully it can be part of our conversation today. So I'm going to ask each of the panelists to start with this question as they give brief comments in a minute. And my first question is this, what should we do now to create the workforce needed to fully realize the future potential of the genetics and genomics uh, field? And so that is my question that I would like for each of you to start with. And with that, I would like to introduce um, our panelists. So you've met Dr. Eric Green, uh, the director of the National Human Genome Research Institute. Uh, and our, our first panelist to speak will be Dr. Chasman Jackson, who's the senior director for DEI for the American Society of Human Genetics, uh, followed by Mark Williams, who is the president of the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics. And finally, with Heather Zerhut, uh, the director uh, the president, excuse me, the president of the National Society of Genetic Counselors. We have a great panel uh, to have this conversation today. Uh, and with that, I'm going to stop sharing. And I would ask Dr. Jackson to start us off. Hello, and thank you so much, uh, Vince, and to NHGRI, Eric, uh, for uh, having today's conversation. I'm happy to join um, everyone um, as a panelist today. To uh, start off with your question of what should we be doing now? Um, I think that mm -hmm. it's important that we not lose momentum and that we maintain laser focus, not only on the uh, importance of diversity, but mm -hmm. also um, the importance of inclusivity and equitability. Diversity, uh, which we've seen in this report that we'll be talking about today is reflective of the representation uh, of our workforce. And it is foundational that we have um, meaningful and representation across our workforce. But also inclusion is just as critical. And to have uh, uh, realize the future potential of genetics and genomics, we also need to ensure there is belonging and accessibility for our workforce. The inclusivity is that part of our training programs and our workplace that does give us um, this, the retention and um, recruitment that we want uh, across the human genetics and genomics field. And lastly, I would say that we have to maintain or uh, galvanize our efforts in equity. I think of equity 
as not only a value, but a strategy. And equity is um, for, for uh, all purposes to ensure fair and just opportunities for all. So those are the, the components that I think will be necessary for us to actually realize this future of, of our genetics and genomics. Thank you, Dr. Jackson, for those initial comments. So Dr. Williams. Thank you, and thanks uh, for the opportunity to participate uh, in this uh, report and also uh, in the webinar. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, our ACMG representatives, Dr. Fuki Sama and Dr. Fabiola Quintero Rivera. Um, they also did double duty. Dr. Hasama also represented the American Board of Medical Genetics and Genomics, and Dr. Quintero Rivera, uh, the Association of Professors of Human and Medical Genetics. Uh, I identified three uh, areas in response to the question posed. Uh, the first is um, uh, we established a, a diversity um uh, equity and Inclusion Committee at the college over three years ago, currently chaired by Dr. Cynthia Zepeda-Mendoza. Um, we've identified a number of initiatives, but um, this report is going to provide a much broader perspective on the workforce initiatives uh, that this committee is considering. And I think it's going to be very useful to take the results uh, and to contextualize those for the um, uh, uh, college as we look to uh, take the uh, areas that we have primary responsibility for and try and build those out. Um, the second um, aspect that as we did a self-evaluation in the context of this issue uh, was uh, the lack of representation and diversity, not only in the workforce as a whole, but in particular in the leadership of the college. And as we began to go through how we chose leaders, uh, we realized that um, we really have to provide opportunities uh, for leadership at the level of committees and working group and tasks for task forces. Uh, because if we don't provide those opportunities, uh, the experience that is needed before uh, becoming a board uh, director or uh, officer uh, is really not available. And so one of the things that we've initiated is that uh, for each committee working group task force that is established, uh, we have a group that reviews that uh, and each uh, proposal has to specifically state what is being done related to diversity of the membership of the group, but also within the context of the proposal, how are aspects of diversity, equity, inclusion being included uh, in the overall uh, project. Um, and I think that's going to be essential to build uh, a diverse uh, pool of leaders within the college uh, that will ultimately um, uh, help us uh, all the way uh, through our different levels of uh, leadership. And I am very pleased that in our last round of elections, uh, Dr. Hasama, uh, one of the representatives on this report, uh, was elected to our board of directors. So that'll be um, uh, very welcome. Lastly, um, I wanted to talk about um, an internal workforce survey that we've done. So even before we um, knew about uh, our opportunity to participate in this particular effort, we had initiated a workforce uh, diversity survey for the uh, uh, ACMG. Um, now we've held off on um, uh, publicizing that report uh, because we wanted to make sure that uh, we took advantage of uh, this report. But I think one of the areas that we'll be able to add some additional insight into is the focus on uh, diversity within clinical and laboratory genetics, which, as you saw from the percentage breakdown, was relatively underrepresented in this uh, overall report. And since that's our area of primary responsibility, uh, we wanted to make sure that we focused on this aspect of the workforce, but also made sure that it um, uh, uh, is in harmony uh, with the broader um, uh, area. The other thing that that workforce survey has looked at, which is also referenced in this report, but has not been mentioned yet, is the maldistribution of genetic services, clinical services within the country. We have vast areas of the country where there are no uh, geneticists, genetic counselors, laboratory geneticists, and that has a real impact on access, which can um, 
uh, exacerbate health disparities. So that's an aspect that we're going to also be working on to say, how can we be creative and innovative to reduce um, these geographic uh, disparities that we've seen uh, develop over time? Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mark. And so Dr. Zerhat, uh, if you could now give from your perspective, uh, your thoughts. Sure. Well, you started with a quote or some quote, so I'll start with one too. So one of my favorites is that we can't change what we don't measure. And I think this has been said by many different people in different ways, but the person that I attribute it to learning about it is Dr. Rachel Hardiman, who studies um, the measurement of structural racism at the University of Minnesota. So go Gophers, that's where I'm from. Um, so I want to thank the genetic counselors that were also on the advisory group, Michelle Takimoto, Barbara Harrison, Nicole Thompson, and the NSGC members and staff who were involved in distributing the survey, and also everyone who took the survey, because um, truly we wouldn't be here today without everyone who took the time and energy to, to help us better understand our workforce. Um, so, but today I'm representing NSGC, and one of our guiding principles is making sure that we can integrate genetics and genomics to improve healthcare for all. So this, this uh, question is particularly important to us as a society, and we can only meet that goal um, by prompting and having active participation in these types of collabor collaborations and having leadership of people with diverse identities and perspectives and backgrounds. Um, and that was very much highlighted in this report. Um, so we, we start by thinking about within our, our organization, but as Mark was saying, this really extends to the larger healthcare systems and research systems where we're actively trying to work to empower our members and advocate others um, to really help create um, a community in which we can serve a diverse um, group of um, individuals in genetic services and research. And so, so think about what we can do now. Um, I, I usually think in, in frameworks and models, but I'll, I'll try to um, not show a graphic, but explain what I, what I mean by this is that there's this complex interplay between us as individuals and how we come to this space, the relationships that we form within our places of employment and where we study, the communities that we, we work in, our professional and healthcare societies, and then societal factors as well. And so what I think we need to do in order to fully recognize our potential is to think about these different levels of influence and how one factor can influence others. And really that we need to think across these multiple levels at the same time to continue to move that progress um, that we were just, that Chasman was talking about to really continue with that momentum moving forward on, on multiple different levels. And so I'll give some um, specific instances um, and, and think about ways that we can create what was I sent, think said in the report as tangible signs that this is a space and a place for inclusive culture. Um, and so um, one example of the key findings was to look at inclusion and exclusion and reward systems. And I think that we can think about how are we forming relationships in graduate training and in our places of employment how are we communicating to make sure that we're using inclusive language and how are we engaging in dialogue for some of these critical conversations that need to happen? How are we um, engaging in these interpersonal dynamics that uplift as um, um, Dr. Williams was saying um, in different positions? And then also how do we foster that mentorship um, to do this work and continue to do this work? Um, and by celebrating and creating rewards and recognition that also increases that sense of belonging that I also agree we can start to think about it and maybe even measure. Um, and then also thinking about this as another form of one of the key findings, which was data transparency metrics and accountability. And that having these types of public displays of our plans of our organization of holding ourselves accountable to our assessments. Um, it can sometimes feel a bit performative as a leader but it really is our way of trying to communicate what we are really trying to do um, and being transparent about it. And so I see this as a transition from an assessment to an action plan. And I think each of our organizations is, is trying to do that and also a way of fostering collaboration. And so the North American genetic counseling organizations have um, put together a statement of collaboration to specifically measure and report back and have shared learnings on um, our JEDI efforts. And then lastly, um, DEI trainings are not enough. One of the other key findings, um, I wanted to uplift some of the words of Dr. Crystal Lumpkins at the University of Utah and Dr. Maya Robertson at Vanderbilt University, both who have expressed to me within the last year and has really 
um, stuck with me, this notion of showing up. So thinking about showing up for these surveys, showing up for our research, showing up for these webinars, showing up for the crucial conversations, showing up for the diverse communities in the areas that we work, and um, really dedicating the energy and resources and the space to do this over time. Um, so I look forward to seeing this full potential and know that it will take time and resources and energy to do so. So thank you. Great. Now, thank you for those, those comments. And I've been hearing already from each of you a little bit about some of the takeaways from the report, but I want to give each of you an opportunity if there are other takeaways that you want to highlight from the report. And I'm going to invite Dr. Green to join uh, in the conversation uh, as appropriate. So uh, really just uh, others, thoughts on other things about the report uh, that are your takeaways that you want to make sure uh, that this audience is aware of. Vince, yes. if I can um, step in here. I, I would also, um, of the many takeaways, I wanted to acknowledge that um, this questionnaire and survey um, took a stance intentionally from its advisory uh, group to create questions, particularly around demographics, that uh, respondents could see themselves. Um, uh, creating that space where the options uh, weren't some of the standard, for example, standard censor, census questions around race and ethnicity, uh, uniquely um, within the human genetics and genomics uh, workforce community, there's often interest to also um, use descriptors around ancestry. So I wanted to, uh, to acknowledge that uh, that advice, I think, was receptive in completion and getting the, the input that we received around um, characteristics and composition of the workforce. Great, thank you. And let me just take a second. I'm asking the audience, we have a, a nice audience for uh, this webinar today. If you have questions, please put your questions uh, in the Q&A uh, and so that we can uh, engage with your, your particular questions of interest. So others thoughts, other takeaways from the report. I mean, Vince, I, I would just add that, you know, the reason NHGRI thought this was a really important um, survey to conduct was, um, you know, really just wanting to make sure we, we didn't pursue our action agenda flying blind. We felt it was important, you know, to, to at least have some, some, some baseline uh, by which we can do future comparisons or we can do um, uh, future surveys. But you know, we just thought it was very important that this needs to be data driven to the best of our abilities, even if even if you know any data you get might be imperfect, and you always think of ways you may want it to be a little bit better. But you know, we shouldn't just um, uh, you know pursue an, an aggressive agenda based on on perceptions or based on anecdotes. And so you know, I, I just think we want to be as thoughtful as we can be and have it be based on. Uh, the most information that we can gather. And so this was a first, it, it by no means is the last step, but it was a very infor important first step. Great, thank you. Yeah, and if I can build on that, I think the, you know, a takeaway, uh, and it's understandable uh, given the nature and the intent of this report, but the takeaway is we've got a lot of work to do. And um, th the actions about what to do next are not immediately apparent. Uh, from the data that we have in front of us. So it's really um, on us to develop an action plan uh, within our each of our organizations, but I think also in um, more broadly across all organizations so that we can mutually reinforce the efforts um, that we're doing to really prioritize uh, what are the things that we all need to be uh, working on together and then I think to echo um, what Heather said, which is we need to be measuring it. So we have to go in and we have to define outcomes and we have to measure those outcomes and hold ourselves accountable if we're not achieving those outcomes. If we don't do that, then this report is really going to lose a lot of the impact that it could potentially have. 
Can I ask a follow-up question, Mark? Is, is, are there ways that ACMG is currently uh, approaching that with regards to its survey data and its, its work within uh, the college? Well, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we did do a workplace uh, uh, workforce survey looking at diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and so we have looked at those um, uh, results uh, in a preliminary sense, but have sort of put that on hold, uh, waiting for this larger report to come out. Um, and so our diversity, equity, and inclusion committee and the board of directors is going to be now moving forward very rapidly to develop some tangible plans uh, to take what we've now learned and to translate that into action, specifically uh, impacting our um, uh, fellows and constituents, but also looking farther into the uh, pipeline uh, back into um, uh, medical education and presumably even into um, uh, pre-medical education to say, how can we really get people engaged uh, in this uh, that, uh, so we can have more, a broader representation and just more folks uh, that are involved in this extremely um, uh, exciting field. Uh, I, I just, I don't know, I get excited every day I go to work. I can't imagine that if we can't craft a message that it's not going to be as engaging to, uh, to everyone and, and we can really achieve um, uh, uh, great things. And, and Heather, I, I want to talk about NSGC. I mean, you guys have a long history of kind of, you know, measuring the field. Can you talk a little bit about some of the survey work that you've done over the years? Sure, yeah. So we have a professional status survey that goes out every other year. And then we also have surveys in those in between years that help us to understand specific things like um, billing and reimbursement, or we did one that was specifically focused on JEDI. And so I appreciate Chaz been talking about in that survey, we really thought about um, increasing the ways that people can identify and um, express that we actually have some measurements of belonging, for instance, in our survey. But to your question, um, when we think about our professional status survey data that goes out to all NSGC members, um, we do see um, a very high level of white women. So there's a lot of homogeneity. And I saw a question in the Q&A about that history, and I'm happy to talk about that at another time. But one of the things I did want to mention is that we also have da data from the National Matching Services. So the genetic counseling field has a match. And we see that even in the last year, we have changing differences in the different diversity dimensions, specifically focused on race and ethnicity. And, um, and so it's we're, we are seeing changes. And one of the things I wanted to highlight, because I was asked by someone who was on this committee to specifically focus, though, is that we still have certain groups where there are less than 2%. So if we look at our Hispanic and our, um, our, our Black um, students coming into the field, those numbers are still particularly low. So I think we, we should think about strategies for thinking about how are we increasing diversity and in specifically to certain groups. And in our field, one of those categories is, is also um, people that identify as male. Um, so I think that there, that is one of the demographics and things that came up from this survey um, that I wanted to talk about also was age. Um, so if you see in the genetic counseling field, 70% of genetic counselors are less than 40 years of age. Um, and that was 42% in this report. So we have a positively skewed distribution. And this is different than other healthcare fields and other types of um, I think science fields maybe even as well. And so we have an opportunity there where we have a lot of people that are quickly entering the field. And so we can do some work and hopefully see some change um, fairly quickly. But that does mean that some of those mentorship opportunities are lower. And so it's putting some energy and thought into how we think about mentorship is also um, an important point. And I'll stop there, but I really want to talk about employment and the distribution of where um, providers are. So if I have an opportunity, I'd love to talk about that too. All right, we will make sure you come back and talk about that. But you, you really kind of laid out a number of challenges for the field of genetic counselors. And I, I, I'm really interested in hearing both from Chasman and Mark, if you could just kind of bring that from other perspectives of the field, of, of what are some of the major challenges that we are struggling uh, as a community today? Um, I think there, there are a number of challenges. I, I would like to... to focus a little on um, our trainees and um, early career professionals. Um, uh, as Heather mentioned, uh, the importance of around mentorship. I'll go even a step further uh, to, to add you know, sponsorship. I think that um, there are obstacles and barriers for many um, in the workforce uh, to receive 
the, that quality um, mentorship and sponsorship. And I think that that is an area that we um, we can work either independently or collaboratively on. ASHG um, has, in partnership with, with NHGRI and, and uh, Biogen and GSK and Merck, um, a flagship program, which is the Human Genetic Scholars Initiative. Um, and that initiative, which was launched in 2019, uh, really does focus on identifying um, and mentoring a select group of, of trainees and early career professionals. Um, and so that has been a, a lot of our um, focus in, in reducing some of the challenges and the pathways that um, uh, the younger uh, professionals are experiencing. Yeah, just a couple of uh, brief comments. Um, it's interesting to contrast what uh, Heather has said about genetic counselors with um, uh, geneticists. Um, we uh, unfortunately are probably skewing the other direction in the age, uh, uh, certainly on the clinical side, and that's going to be an issue for us as we look at uh, workforce going forward is, um, you know, how can we really attract uh, more uh, young professionals into the, uh, into the career and make sure that they um, uh, are of diverse backgrounds. I think particularly on the laboratory genetics side, um, we're probably, um, uh, we're, we're looking a bit better on the diversity side uh, because we have a lot of uh, individuals from international backgrounds that um, are practicing uh, in the field. And as a consequence, we are um, somewhat less uh, homogeneous when it comes to um, representation of some aspects of race and ethnicity, but certainly I think we continue to be underrepresented compared to the United States population uh, in uh, individuals of uh, African descent and um, uh, those of uh, Hispanic uh, Latinx uh, descent. So those are areas where we clearly have not done as uh, good a job. And one of the interesting things that we found out as we were sort of exploring uh, pipeline issues is that um, we reached out to the uh, five uh, medical schools associated with historically black uh, colleges and universities. Uh, not one of those um, uh, colleges and universities has a board certified uh, laboratory or clinical geneticist as a faculty member. Um, so we have no one there to even represent the profession uh, to these individuals uh, to get them excited about it. So we're now partnering not only with um, those colleges and universities, but also with other medical schools that do not have uh, board certified uh, genetics professionals on their faculty to uh, have the college provide um, uh, opportunities for education uh, around genetics uh, that they can use as part of their curriculum. And so we're hoping that that will uh, develop uh, some more interest at the medical student level, as well as um, funding some um, uh, student uh, interest groups in genetics at, at medical schools, which are funded through the American College of Medical Genetics and Genetics Foundation. Um, so these are some grassroots efforts uh, that will take a few years to um, uh, hopefully uh, bear fruit, but certainly uh, it are, are things that we're very interested and in, very active in um, studying how that's going to impact uh, uh, not only getting more younger folks interested in the profession, but also a diverse, uh, more diverse group. Great, thank you. So we've gotten a number of questions in, so I'm going to start to just kind of go through some of the questions that we have from our, um, our audience today, uh, and uh, if you can respond. So my, my first question here is with regards to um, how can the long-standing uh, telehealth genetic co uh, counseling options augment the access efforts uh, mentioned by uh, Mark Williams? So uh, Heather, this is a question for you. How, how can telehealth and genetic counseling be a benefit to health equity? Yeah, I mean, as post pandemic telehealth has absolutely changed um, the way that genetic counselors are practicing. Um, I think nearly 70% of even clinical genetic counseling is done with a remote component um, some of the time. And so I do think that does help for some. Um, there is other, when we talk about those different levels, there's other things like societal issues, like getting broadband access and getting the abilities to get to various different places to provide a full telehealth experience. Um, there's obviously telephone, things like that. So there are ways that we are absolutely expanding access to rural areas. 
I will say though, however, um, getting support to community-based clinics continues to be a significant challenge. And this is really important and it goes back to the access issues that we were talking about and gives me the perfect opportunity to get in that fact that I wanted to about employment. So in this report, 13% of people um, that responded were employed at a private or community-based clinic and only 1% in a government hospital. And we see similar data in our PSS where we just are not able to um, be able to support genetic counselors and community care. And that is where the majority of people are getting services in this country. And so if you're not at an academic health center, which has the ability to compensate for those services and other types of revenue streams, um, you are not able to provide that service to the people where they need it and when they need it um, on a regular basis. And so we really need to think about expanding our positions. And in order to do that, a critical issue is ensuring that we have insurance coverage that payers are, are also paying for those services and that we're being recognized by the federal um, government by the Center for Medicaid and Medicaid Services. And so those the ability to bill and be reimbursed would allow us to expand where we are able to practice services and also where we are then able to recruit because you want to see someone who is able to understand what the genetic counseling is and get access to referrals to care in the communities where you are most comfortable. So thank you for that question. Thank you. So this is a question you so, go ahead, Mark. Beth, if I could uh, just add on just a couple things. First of all, this is, I think, one area where we can at least hold up a little bit of a uh, placard of success. Um, telegenetics has actually been uh, in use um, in some parts of the country for over 20 years. So Maine uh, uh, was one of the original leaders. And then um, uh, genetic services in the Pacific Islands, both the clinical genetics and genetic counseling, has been studied uh, in these settings. Um, and actually, uh, with the exception of a few things that involve physical examination, uh, the outcomes are, that have been achieved are essentially equivalent to in-person. So I think we actually have some good data uh, that this is an effective thing. And we had some opportunities that Heather alluded to with the pandemic, where a lot of the regulations that were impeding our ability to provide telemedicine services were relieved in the context of the pandemic. Now, the problem is, is that regulations are trying to go back to where we were uh, before the pandemic. And I think that's a really bad idea. So we've been advocating uh, very strongly at the legislative level, level to try and keep uh, the ability to access telemedicine services um, as they are. And Heather put her finger on it. The digital divide is a big issue. The fact that you can have telemedicine doesn't mean that you are somehow fixing the access problem because there's lots of people in lots of parts of the country that do not have access to high-speed internet and don't even have reliable cell phone service. So we can't consider this to be a panacea. Thank you. So, so the next question is for the group. Um, how do we reach the people who need to hear the messaging from the report, um, but who are not at this webinar? And you know, there, there are thousands of those individuals, our, our colleagues across the country and across the world. What, what can we do? I think it's a great start that we're having this uh, initial conversation at the webinar, but as you just inferred that this needs to be a continuous discussion. Um, I think that it's also important that we use all of our channels, including um, social media. Uh, I think also um, having, having opportunities to uh, hear from our communities and in a listening session type mode. I'm aware that there uh, many of our organizations um, have not only you know report it out, but really value that input that we that we necessarily need to make some of these um, these changes. So I, I would say beyond the, the webinar itself, the continuation of dialogue and using all of our platforms um, to reach as many people as we can. So, Are we gonna TikTok? Should we make yeah, a TikTok? Go, no, go for it, no, 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 we're not gonna do that. Um, I'll just say one more thing. I think that it's important to integrate into continuing education and to really take the, the stage, the, like be on the plenaries, be on the important talks, be on the ones that everyone's listening to. Um, and uh, we've seen that be really, I think, helpful for our organization. Everyone's at a different point in their journey, but to have everyone in your organization at a large event 
um, be, be a part to hear what your organization is doing and how you're doing it. And then the other thing I'll just say, I was kind of joking about TikTok, but kind of not, in that we have to make this information easy and accessible. So infographics, dashboards, quick things that people can reference that aren't highly detailed, but that can link to the details for everyone else, I think has been really effective for us as well. Maybe this is an opportunity for collaboration among the organizations to kind of create some of these resources uh, that can be used across them. Great. Uh, so the next question is really more about our field. So it says, do you think human genetics and genomics training is a barrier to diversifying the workforce? And if so, what can human genetics and genomics training programs do to promote diversity? Well, Heather referenced uh, quotes that she likes. I reference a quote that I like by Deming, uh, an engineer who said, systems are perfectly designed to give you the results that you see. Um, so I would say our human genetics training programs are perfectly designed to give us the uh, uh, level of diversity that we're currently seeing. So I think in that way, the answer to the question is probably yes. Now, having said that, um, understanding why uh, and how we can re-engineer these programs to uh, uh, change that, I think, is uh, the really challenging part. Measurement of you know, the, the baseline is an important first step, and so that's why this report is going to be so foundational. But I think now that we are clearly uh, aware and have quantified the problem, we're now going to have to do the deep dive and say, what is it about the way we structure our uh, training and our recruitment of trainees and our messaging around our field that is basically creating the scenario and what do we need to do to change it? Any other thoughts from the panelists? I can jump in. Um, uh, twofold kind of what Mark was also saying in that we have we used to use the term pipeline, right? But that made like one access point coming in. And now we've tried to use pathways and in, in growing and being again, kind of intentional about where we're going and how we're thinking about our field. In genetic counseling, we actually have about 50% of um, the people that apply or get into the matching services who are not matched, which means we have an overabundance of people that are interested in genetics and genetic counseling. And so how do we think about, as we were saying, collaboratively coming together and thinking about what are the different types of roles within the genetics workforce? Um, and maybe also encouraging, you know, some people that may, genetic counseling may not be for them or that may not be, how do we, how do we, you know, work together to, to bring people into the field? Um, and making sure that our pipelines are not just getting bigger, that we are actually making pathways, I think is one of the things I think about. And the two areas um, where I think we need to think about barriers from this data specifically is in those that identified a dis as disadvantaged, whether that's economic or low income or rural areas, um, foster care or not having a parent or legal guard guardian that has a bachelor's degree. I think that's an area where um, we see differences also in racial differences and that maybe that we're able to um, support recruitment into the field um, for those that identify as white, but less so um, for racial or minoritized um, individuals, and then also those that identify as a disability, with 3% um, of individuals in this report um, identifying that way. And also, there was comments about being afraid to disclose disability status, um, as well as not having accommodations. So those are direct examples of ways in which we know that there's barriers and that people are identifying them in the report. Thank you. So the next question is related to the professional societies directly. Have the societies connected with traditionally minority serving institutions? And then it goes on and says, is NHGRI leading this work? Um, and, and how could the groups work together to build a more diverse group of professionals entering the field and getting excited about genetics and genomics? And what barriers exist to improving these relationships? Well, I'll, I'll start from an NHGRI perspective. So um, the, the, the Genome Institute has been involved in a variety of, of engagement with uh, minority serving institutions, as well as other institutions that are not um, research intensive institutions that are a part of our, our general grantee portfolio. And so 
One of the initiatives that I would just highlight is the GREAT Award program, where we are both targeting minority serving institutions, but also ideal states. So that's the state of Montana and Wyoming and Idaho and the institutions in those states as states to engage around working with uh, research intensive genomic institutes to bring exposure to their students. So that's one step and one example of what we're doing in, in, in that strategy of working with institutions that may not be uh, traditionally part of the research institutions that receive uh, funding from our institute. Uh, one recent example that um, I could highlight is a collaboration between um, ASHG and NSGC uh, in our efforts to exhibit and attend um, SACNIS and ABRACAM, which are uh, conferences that um, include uh, trainees and students and faculty from um, minority serving institutions uh, or um, uh, peoples from peoples who have been historically excluded uh, within the field. And so that, that's that been a, um, a consecutive number of years that we've been engaging in that uh, even through the, through the pandemic. Um, as also as a part of uh, ASHG's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Action Plan, it is our efforts um, in the coming months to uh, create uh, an, an, uh, our bridge and avenue to engage with minority serving institutions, in particular starting with um, our historically Black colleges and universities. So that, that is um, a part of our, um, our action agenda. Thank you. Anything else anyone wants to share on that topic? I was just going to highlight what Jasmine said. So thank you for doing it for me. And then also that we have a lot of partnerships and collaborations. So as a professional organization, we really help to support the other groups that are doing it like MGPN. Um, and um, and I'll, I'll just say that like there's still a lot of work that needs to be done in resourcing and, fund and funding these types of um, master's programs in genetic counseling, even with the exponential growth. Um, and particularly at um, historically black colleges, there was a partnership with Xavier University. Um, and I think they were looking for a program director. So I'm just giving them a shout out if they're still looking for a program director. I don't know if they are, but like we need to support the people that are really doing this work too to start these new initiatives because it's a lot of it's a lot of uplift to get something like that started. So thank you and, and thank you for that shout out to, to Xavier University. Um, so the next question is, how do you plan to disseminate your action points and plans beyond just engaged parties? I think there may be eager people who want to engage in JEDI efforts, but the ones we need to reach you often aren't showing up and don't prioritize these efforts. Any successful examples so far? I'll just uh, mention again our intentional effort to make sure that we have diversity represented on all of our committees and working groups. Um, that has um, uh, necessitated, uh, in some cases, outreach uh, from um, um, fellows of the college that are involved in these activities uh, to individuals that haven't necessarily uh, raised their hand to volunteer through the regular uh, volunteer channels. And so we've been very intentional about trying to uh, uh, reach out. And that's really grown our uh, pool of individuals that are available to uh, participate in the work that not only brings that important perspective to all of the work that we're doing, but also provides um, these individuals uh, opportunities to um, uh, co-author high impact publications, to um, uh, advance um, uh, academic careers, um, develop visibility in the field, and in the long run, uh, you know, should help us to be able to uh, develop a, a great cadre of leaders going forward that is going to continue to uh, multiply these efforts. So I can just add that we, we finalized our um, GEDI action plan over this past year, and one of the exercises that we did was review all of our committees and their charges and see where that action plan um, kind of came together. And so if you're involved and you're volunteering with NSGC, you're going to see 
that it's interwoven throughout our committees and our charges, and then also see the accountability each year or each half of year, or even quarter um, that we're going to be doing with pulse surveys. And so I think that just that continual momentum that has been talked about that continually showing that we're doing work and that we're integrating it throughout our organization, as well as our educational opportunities so that people are, are seeing it within their space and their work and their specialties, and they can actually see how it's integrated and applied um, has been one way that I think we've been trying to think about it at the organizational level that we hope goes through that, you know, the level to the individual. And at ASHG, um, I, I want to frame it as that, um, you know, we have a, a organizational strategic plan, um, 2020, 2019 to 2023. And one of the um, key goals in that strategic plan was, or uh, is ASHG being a recognized leader in valuing, embodying, um, and driving diversity, equity, and inclusion in human genetics and genomics. And so what that means for us is that it's it's a part of our uh, mission and vision. And so it, it is uh, infecting the policies that we promote, the programming that we do, our annual meeting. And so um, structurally, we have a, a DEI task force that reports to our board. Um, and each of the task force members are uh, represented across the committees uh, of our organization. But there's also uh, through that action plan, and because it is integrated as part of our uh, function and work as an organization, there's many opportunities for our membership um, and, and colleagues to, to engage and participate in advancing uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. I want to talk about um, early in the pathway. Um, one of the things that the Genome Institute decided to do with its action agenda is to start with a goal of exposing the general public and K-12 education to the fields of genetics and genomics and potential career opportunities and thinking about the pathway very early on. And we're all you know, really um, focused on at the, the time of either a transition into clinical practice and clinical professional positions or research positions. Can you talk a little bit about what, what we should be doing with the general public and our efforts that we should be doing early and at early education, thinking about K-12 education? Are there strategies and approaches that you think we should be addressing? I can start. I can start us off. Um, I, I think that uh, um, one, just even promoting um, the excitement around human genetics and genomics for um, for high schoolers or, or students um, earlier in the pathway is important. Uh, one aspect, which I think several of, of um, peer associations as well as NHGRI is doing, is uh, use, utilizing things like DNA Day as an avenue to introduce the field um, as an opportunity um, of uh, and, and sparking the, the interest pretty early on. Uh, that continuation, I think those types of, of activities um, are important so that uh, for, for those who, who may not be aware or, or even um, have access to, to what's available uh, that early in, in the pathway. So I'm just gonna let everybody know, I'm gonna come at the end and give everyone an opportunity to make some closing comments. So you can start thinking about your closing comments. Uh, but I got a question and I'm gonna expand the question that I got because the, the question was focused just on genetic counseling, but I'm gonna really expand it to the broader field of genetics and gen genomics that we're uh, exploring today and, and, and what, how we can learn from history. Uh, and the question with regards to you know, how do we get to where we are here in 2022 with regards to what our workforce looks like? And, and are there lessons that we can learn from that as we go forward to, to make sure that the workforce looks much more uh, like our, our country? Uh, and so, so any, any thoughts on this? Um, you know, the question that was directly was related to you, Heather, and uh, the history of the genetic counseling program, but I think we need to think about it more broadly. And so I would love any comments from from the group.
I can paraphrase um, and I can from a talk that was at the recent NSGC meeting by Michelle Takimoto, um, who was talking about the history of the field and before the MGPN, um, Minority Genetics Professionals Network, was put together and how coming into the field, um, there, there really wasn't a place to have that community to speak about the different identities that people had and how that was influencing um, their experiences. And I, so when I think about the history in genetic counseling, there was a lot of people that tried to do this work ahead of us that had done a, a tremendous amount um, and that we we didn't gather the, the um, the ability to do so, to do so, and so again, that's when I think about the various different factors that need to happen, and and it started with finding a place for people to come together to try to make um, make actual progress and have the data to do it, um, and and to think about what are the most important things that we need to think about as we move forward. And as an outcomes researcher, I think about interventions um, and how do we create mentorship. And one of the things that Michelle talked about is having MGPN as a space for mentorship. That is, that's a form of a way that we can intervene to try to make a big change or that funding can help to do that. So that's a grant funded um, group and similar to Golden um, and some of these other groups, I'm gonna get the name wrong, but it's the genetics. I wrote it down just so I would have it. The Genetics Opportunities Learning Development and Empowerment Network, um, which is specifically focused on, you know, thinking about pathways um, for individuals that come from Black or African American backgrounds. And so I think we we have a history to look back on and, and see what didn't work well and make the, the really interventions that need to happen. And that requires financial resources, a long term commitment um, and infusing it throughout all of our organizations um, and really creating this space for people to come together that that really have the solutions and the experience to do that. That. Right. Thank you. So I'm going to ask. The history ahead, relates to evolution versus um, design. Um, you know, our fields, you know, sort of evolved from interested individuals pulling together different things, and they just sort of self-assembled, as Heather said. But we are at a point now where we cannot rely on that uh, to move us to the next level. We have to be very intentional uh, about saying we've gotten to this point. But we've also got the results that we got because we used the prior methods. How can we intentionally redesign what we're doing to make ourselves inclusive and to attract uh, people that you know otherwise would not be aware of what we're doing or not be interested in doing what we think is really exciting because the way we've self-assembled has um, uh, just excluded them by the inherent nature of uh, the biases that were built into that. So I think, the, again, the, the time is now to be intentional about what we're going to be doing next. Great, thank you. So I'm going to ask uh, last comments from each of you, uh, give each of you about a minute for any last comments that you would like to share with um, the audience. And I'll start with you, Dr. Jackson, as the, the first speaker. Um, my my parting uh, comments is one of of gratitude. Uh, I want to uh, acknowledge and, and thank NHGRI for seeing the need to bring uh, uh, associations associations like us together uh, in this collective effort to um, look at the future of the field and hopefully it being more diverse and inclusive and equitable. Um, I also uh, think, you know, based on some of the conversations and saying the the, the challenges, uh, a, a takeaway for me is the opportunities that we can share together. Um, we each are doing uh, important work. We have um, uh, action plans and strategies uh, as independent associations. Uh, there's great value and even some of the questions that have been raised here today of opportunities that we can uh, join for us together. Uh, so I, I would end with, with, um, with you know, an emphasis on uh, creating a, a, a better future, uh, not only with, with a diverse representation of the workforce, but in a culture and climate that, that is uh, inclusive and equitable, and let's do it together. Dr. Williams. I didn't quite have enough time to Google the Institute of Medicine a quote from the uh, uh, crossing the quality chasm, which is what I really needed because it's it's so be beautifully um, expressed. But essentially, what it says is 
you know, uh, it is not enough to talk about it. it. It's now the time to do it. And so we have the baseline. We've got a great start with uh, this report and the work that all of our organizations have done uh, individually and together. Now we have to build on that and say, what are we going to do next? How are we going to do it? How are we going to measure it? And how are we going to help everybody learn uh, from our successes and from our failures? Because we're going to have a lot of both. Right. Dr. Zerha. I think in our report, it was less talk, more action. <laughs> that was the quote from our report. Um, but I I did focus a lot on barriers, but I do see so many opportunities. And um, I in my state of the society, as I closed off the year, um, I was reminded that, yes, we really need to have a focus on how we're thinking about equity. And uh, so thank you um, for, for reminding me of that. And I'll just stress that, again, to realize the interconnectedness of these issues and that they uh, there's multiple layers to them and thinking about them across all of those layers and trying to do trying to think about how we're going to do all of them um, across addressing them at these multiple levels all at the same time. Um, and I also hope that as I was thinking it, one of the questions we were asked to think about was to the future and how do we start measuring the outcomes of these now key findings? So thinking about belonging, inclusive spaces, recognition, microaggressions, and, and really defining what we mean um, by belonging. And so I also have to do one more thing, and this is completely counter to who I am as an outcomes researcher, but action is happening, and sometimes it actually is hard to define and measure. And Deepti Babu, the incoming president of NSGC, I would be remiss if I, I didn't say this because she reminds me that there are many things that are impactful and that we cannot always um, measure those, and culture change is one of them. And I appreciate being a part of this and hopefully a part of that culture change moving forward. So thank you again for the invitation. Thank you. And thank you for each of you. So a couple comments, and then I'm going to give it over to Dr. Green to close us out. One is we got a number of other questions that we weren't able to answer. So we will um, have a conversations and we will um, make sure we share uh, back um, responses to some of those questions. Um, we want to just, again, thank everybody who participated today. And I'm looking forward to the collaborations that we're going to have as professional societies and organizations and really trying to make change. So, so on behalf of, of the TIDE office, the Trained Diversity Health Equity Office uh, and um, NHGRI, I'm looking forward to working with each of you and your organizations as we go forward. So with that, Eric, for any closing comments. Absolutely. Thank you, Vince. Um, boy, that hour flew by and we really covered a lot of ground. Um, let me first thank our partners who uh, came and spoke today and shared their thoughts. I, I think you can very much appreciate the fact that these different organizations, um, including our own, are, are are using different lenses to look at this landscape and different um, perspectives, uh, considerable overlap, but also some unique features. And that's what makes this very synergistic and very collaborative. And so I sort of want to echo uh, Vence's enthusiasm for continued interactions among these groups and continued collaborations. Um, I certainly want to thank well over 100 of you who have participated in this. We were quite impressed with how many joined us today. We hope this was helpful, and we hope it'll be the first of many uh, conversations we'll continue to have with you. And I want to thank Vince for moderating it and really uh, spearheading a lot of this and organizing it. And with, with his leadership has been pivotal for seeing us move forward in this action agenda and uh, stimulate these interactions among the community. So with that, um, I'll, I'll bring this to an end, uh, thanking everybody one last time. And the key is to be continued because that's where we're heading. Thank you. Thank you.